Alright guys, Mr. Arnold, come back to another episode of History Comes Alive. And in today's History Comes Alive episode, we are going to be looking at World War I. Alright, in World War I, what I want you guys to keep in mind is the four years in which it occurred, between 1914 and 1918. We're going to separate this video into four distinct segments. The first segment is dealing with the main causes, okay? Keep in uh, mind the term main. Our second segment is going to be dealing with the geography, dealing with World War I and the battlefronts in which we see battles fought. Our third segment is going to be dealing with the changes we see in World War I as well as the key events that we are going to analyze. And then our fourth segment, we are going to be looking at the Paris Peace Conference, specifically delving into and diving into the Treaty of Versailles and the Big Three. So make sure you guys are watching very closely, and this is for DJ Davis. Take copious notes. I'll see you on the flip side. What's up guys, how's it going? Mr. Arnold coming back for this first segment. And in this first segment, we're gonna be talking about the main, the main causes for World War I. When we talk about World War I, what I want you guys to remember is this mnemonic device, main. Each letter in main is gonna represent some sort of term that I want you guys to remember. The first letter when we look at main is M. And we're gonna specifically look at militarism. Militarism, what I want you guys to remember, the two key words when we look at its definition are this, the buildup. It's the buildup, the buildup of arms in one's country, whether that's resources such as men or supplies or actual arms that are going to be used in war, such as airplanes or tanks or actual guns. We are going to start to see that building up in a country, and that's called militarism, okay? Militarism is our first all right, cause here in World War I. When we talk about militarism, keep in mind that in Germany, we are gonna to start to see a huge army being built. We see the armies become twice the size that they once were before, under Otto von Bismarck and later under the Kaiser Wilhelm II, okay? Keep that in mind. We also see the British Navy expand and we start to see more and more battleships produced than ever before. And this is gonna help Britain expand its empire. The second cause that we're going to analyze is alliances. The definition of alliances is this, the agreement two or more countries make for protection. All right. And the key words I really want you guys to dive into here is this, the agreement. Okay. Many countries in Europe pre-World War I had agreements set up. Specifically, the Triple Entente, which included England, France, as well as Russia. And then when we look at the Triple Alliance, we're going to see Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy all joining together in alliances for protection. So there's your specific example. Our next cause is the I in Maine, imperialism. We know what the definition of imperialism is. It's the taking over of one country by another for either political or economic gain, ladies and gents. And the specific example where we see this is all throughout the world. Specifically, we could look at Africa or China and talk about how European countries were slicing and dicing it up for their natural resources, markets, but also for control and colonizing those places, okay? Keep that in mind. With this imperialism, the key idea that I really want you to remember is this, that we are going to see rivalries exist. Now, I know you've seen rivalries maybe in athletic events such as Duke versus North Carolina, or we've seen rivalries play out in some of the movies that you've seen, all right? Some of the classic rivalries, okay? But the key theme to keep in mind is this, that with imperialism, with this competition, we are gonna see rivalries, and we're not gonna see countries begin to really like each other. It's not very peachy when you think about it, okay? Next, we're gonna be talking about nationalism. That's our last letter here, ladies and gents. And nationalism is the pride one has in their country. We see nationalism as a unifying force in both Germany and Italy, but it can also be a dividing force in places like the Ottoman Empire, which will later fall and become Turkey, as well as in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire post-World War I, where we see the breakup of Austria and Hungary. All right? So keep in mind the four letters there, N-A-I-N. 
all right? Militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Okay, guys? That's all I have for this first segment. I got a lot more stuff coming in segment two. I'll see you then. What's up guys, how's it going? Mr. Arnold coming back for this second segment. In this second segment, we're going to be talking about geography tied into World War I or the Great War. It's also known as the Great War. Now, a couple things I want you guys to keep in mind when we talk about geography is know that this occurred in the continent of Europe, okay? So we're talking about European countries. We will have outside countries like the United States, like Austria, like New Zealand fighting in this war, but it'll be at a later time and it'll be all in Europe, ladies and gents. So when we talk about World War I, let's focus our attention, boom, right here at the map. In this map, we will see two different sets of countries belong to two different sets of alliances. The first alliance that we're gonna talk about is the Triple Entente, which would include England, France, as well as Russia. They make up the Triple Entente. The Triple Alliance, ladies and gents, is going to be made up of Germany, Austria, Hungary, as well as Italy. Now, before World War I really gets started here, ladies and gents, we are gonna see the Balkan states be an area, a region in Eastern Europe full of tension, ladies and gents, tension. They're gonna call this the powder keg of Europe. And we're gonna dive into this subject in our next segment, dealing with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. But let's go back and revisit the uh, geography during World War I. The, what I really wanna focus on here in the second map is how things are gonna change. We're gonna see Italy go from being part of the Triple Alliance to now being part of the allied countries, joining the Entente. Next, when we talk about this, I want really to, you guys to really focus on the central powers, that being of Germany, Austria-Hungary, also we're gonna see Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire joining the central powers. And when we talk about World War I, those are gonna be the guys that are gonna fight against the allied countries, what used to be the Triple Entente. Now, when we look at the geography, it's also gonna play a huge role in terms of the battle tactics used. We have two different fronts that are gonna be uh, the theaters of war in fighting. We're going to have the Western Front and the Eastern Front. The Western Front is going to be mostly a stalemate, a stalemate in which we see no real advantages or disadvantages or any gain being done. Now, in addition to that, we're also going to see the use of naval warfare take shape. We are going to see the British blocking off the northern shores of Germany along the Northern Sea as well as the Baltic Sea. It's cutting them off from supplies. In addition, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna see the U-boats of Germany being used along the eastern, I'm sorry, the western Atlantic seaboard here in Europe. But the key idea is this, that all throughout World War I, all throughout World War I, we are going to see the central powers fighting against the allied countries. The Triple Entente versus the Triple Alliance, okay? It's gonna be a group of countries fighting against each other. All right, keep that in mind when we discuss the geography. All right, that's all I have for the second segment. We're gonna go into our third segment, dealing with the changes and events we see in World War I. I'll see you guys soon. What's up guys, how's it going? Mr. Arnold coming back for this third segment. In this third segment, we're gonna be looking at some changes that occurred in World War I and some events that occurred in World War I. Some notable changes and events. The first change that I'd like to talk about occurred along the Western Front here in Europe during the time of the Great War, remember, AKA World War I. It's another name for it. We are gonna see a change in which we see the uh, change in the way wars are gonna be fought. Along the Western Front, we see mostly a stalemate occur throughout the whole war in which we're not going to really see one side like the Allied powers or the Central powers gain an advantage. 
Why, you may be asking? Well, that's because throughout most of the war, it was a trench war in which we see trench warfare taking place. As you can tell by some of these images, trench warfare was a very rough way to fight a war for a soldier. We see lots of diseases, we see lots of uh, problems that exist, such as not getting enough supplies. We see diseases such as trench foot or body lice developing during this time of trench warfare, in which it's not really the most humane way to live and fight a war. It was not for the glamorous, as you can tell right here. That trench foot right there, I would not want to take that and clean it off for a medicure. That would not be very fun. But the key thing to keep in mind with trench warfare is this, that because it was so defensive, the strategy in which its tactics was used, you dug in and you stayed in that position, we're not gonna see much of an advantage being gained by either side. We're gonna see mostly throughout World War I, along the Western Front, a war of attrition in which the winner was the one who had the most people on their side at the end of the day. The winner was the one who had the most resources and people that were on their side at the end of the day. So it mattered most who could help support their boys on the front lines the most. That was gonna be the country that was gonna win alongside the Western Front. Now, we're also gonna see new technology being used in World War I. Remember, World War I occurred after the Industrial Revolution, after this age of inventions, after the age of industry. So we're gonna see certain things such as the machine gun being used, airplanes, tanks, submarines like U-boats that Germany had. We're gonna see all these things going to be used and the key theme that I want you guys to remember about this new technology being used in World War I is that we're gonna see an absurd amount of casualties. This is the first world war where we see a huge amount, a huge amount of casualties, death or wounded. We have 8.5 million people who died on the battlefields. Another 24 million or so wounded because of the warfare that was going on in World War I and the technology used. Now let's dive into the events in World War I. Let's talk about the spark, the one event that's really gonna kickstart things and lead to a domino effect. When we look up here on the map, remember the Balkan region, that's the powder keg of Europe, ladies and gents. Powder keg because it was so tense. All that was needed was a spark and we'd see one minor event later leading to a major conflict. When we look at the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, this is the spark that we're talking about. Gavrilo Princip, this guy in right here, he was a Serbian nationalist. He was from Serbia, and he was not okay with Bosnia being a part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. He felt that Bosnia should belong to Serbia, not Austria-Hungary. So as a jealous boy who liked a girl would do, he put matters into his own hands and decided to fight it. So what he's going to do is he's essentially going to shoot both Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife. He's going to Swiss cheese them up. Three shots to the chest and Archduke Franz Ferdinand is going to die. Now as a result, we are going to see Austria-Hungary enter war with Serbia. Remember, Serbia is going to have an alliance set up with Russia as well as Germany supporting Austria-Hungary. So in all that right there, I know it might seem like a lot, but in all that right there, we're gonna to start to see alliances kick in and a full-scale war being created. Now over time, we will see those Russians again, but they are eventually going to lose out to the Germans on the Eastern Front. Why? Because Germany was dealing with its own revolution, its own real problems to begin with. Russia was on the brink of revolution right around the time of World War I, and as a result, they had to fall to the Germans. Over time, however, the key thing I want you guys to remember is this, that because Russia is gonna fall to Germany, we're eventually gonna see the Germans and the allied countries going out, all out, total war on the Western Front. That's the key thing I want you to keep in mind when we see the Russians bow out from World War I. We're gonna see full-scale war on the Western Front, and this is gonna lead us to our last point, the United States' entry into World War I. Because the Germans are going to put all the resources towards the Western Front, because Kaiser really is gonna go full-fledged here into France, he's gonna lead a massive attack, the United States is gonna be needed. And there's gonna be a couple events in which the United States is gonna go from being neutral to now being full-fledged participant in World War I. The first event that's noteworthy is this, the Singular Lusitania, in which it was a ship, an ocean liner, taking path from New York to Liverpool. 
all right? During this voyage, the German U-boats are going to sink this ship because they believe there's ammunition on board and supplies that were helping the Allied countries. Keep in mind, there's going to be innocent passengers that are going to ultimately die. About 1,100 die, notably about 132 Americans. And this is an important event because this is the first time in American history where we see the Americans really get a distrust for the Germans. They see the Germans and their public opinion on them starts to sway to that being of negative. All right, so you start to see more and more Americans starting to think that World War I might be a good idea. Now. It will take another two years before the Americans finally enter. The Singing of Lusitania occurred in 1915. 1917 is when the Americans finally entered. The one event that's really going to kind of kickstart everything for the United States' involvement is the sending of the Zimmerman telegram, in which we see a telegram being sent from Germany to Mexico, urging the Mexicans to fight against the Americans, hoping that they can kind of distract them from aiding the British and the French and the other allied countries. This telegram had some goals in it. It would say that, that if they were victorious, the Germans and the Mexicans against the allied countries, they would be granted Texas, Arizona, New Mexico back into Mexico. Because remember, the United States of America won it over when we were going through that manifest destiny phase. All right, keep that in mind. They won that over. This is something to keep in mind because the United States of America, ladies and gents, will now have an excuse to enter. Now their flames have really been fueled by the Germans and they will go full-fledged and become a participant in World War I. That's all I have for this third segment, dealing with the events and the changes in World War I. We're gonna move on to the next segment, dealing with the end of World War I in the Paris Peace Conference. I'll see you there, guys. Take care. What's up guys, how's it going? Mr. Ron, come back for this last segment. And in this last segment, we're gonna be talking about the end of World War I. We are gonna be talking about the Paris Peace Conference, a meeting in which we see the allied countries coming together and meeting together and determining the fate and futures of Europe, ladies and gents, of Europe. We're gonna separate this video into three different sections, so get ready for it. The first section being this, the effects of World War I. We are gonna see World War I become a war of attrition, a kind of last man, thing, uh, last man standing, so to speak, where the last men standing are gonna be crowned victorious. The Germans are gonna be the ones who are going to be crowned the losers here. They're gonna be the losers because they are going to give up, all right? They're eventually going to lead a mutiny against Kaiser Wilhelm and they're going to give in to the allied countries. So as a result, we're gonna see a couple effects. The first one being this, war guilt. We are gonna see the allied countries punish Germany. We're gonna see the big three, such as uh, Lloyd George of the UK, Georges Clemenceau of France, and do not forget, Woodrow Wilson of the United States all come together at the Paris Peace Conference and they're gonna try and devise a plan to meet the needs of Europe, okay? To meet the needs of Europe. And two out of three, George and Clemenceau, they're gonna have an agenda in mind to punish the Germans. Woodrow Wilson's gonna come up with this idea of 14 points as well as the League of Nations and it's gonna try and promote diplomacy and world peace and maintaining world peace and trying to prevent World War I from happening. However, the two other individuals, George as well as Clemenceau of France, they are going to already have an agenda in mind to punish Germany. And this is gonna lead us to the Treaty of Versailles. Much of the Treaty of Versailles was unfair to the Germans. They are going to punish them. They are going to give them hard, uh, I guess you could say, obstacles to overcome. The Germans had to pay $30 billion back then, which is close to $2.7 trillion in 2015. 
Think about that. That's pretty insane when you also think about the fact that much of their economy was militarized. And now that the war is over, their economy is going to sink. It's very similar to what we see in America with the Great Depression, all right? Lots of people are going to be left out on the streets. The price of bread is going to skyrocket and we're going to see lots of inflation. But all this is going to lead to World War II. Instead of doing what we did after World War II and the Civil War where we rebuilt the countries or areas that were affected by war, World War I is going to punish Germany and it's going to set the stage for fascism to arise in Germany and Adolf Hitler and the Nazis to take power in Germany. Think about it. If the other European countries actually promoted the League of Nations or the 14 points, and if we brought stability to Germany, we might not have seen Adolf Hitler as well as Nazi Germany rise to power. Instead, it allowed for basically anybody to rise to power as long as they could promote prosperity and success within Germany, which Adolf Hitler did in his short time in the beginning of his reign in Germany. But that's all I have for this seg uh, segment as well as video dealing with World War I. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know it's a little longer, but there's a lot of great stuff on here. Please feel free to leave me a comment or subscribe to the channel. I'll talk to you guys later. I'll see you soon. Take care for this episode of History Comes Alive. I'll see you soon, guys. Take care.